for IDATE, this is our 10th year. A lot of you guys showed up and were supportive of us over 10 years. So this is the first time we've ever had, I think, you know, officially, I mean, we already made this before, before, but certainly this is the first time we've ever had Dr. Neil Clark Warren, me on CEO of Amazon. Folks will be interviewing. Anyway, so I'm going to meet you tomorrow, and Neil, and you guys will do your thing, and I imagine you're going to ask some questions, and then there'll be some questions from the audience afterward. All right, so I think there's nobody that is as well known in this industry as Dr. Neil Clark Warren. Uh, no one's been as, as visible for the industry, and I think no one has really built this industry as much as Dr. Neil Clark Warren has with his visibility on TV and the incredible amount of advertising they've done on TV. That's a great service for all of us, really. Um, let me give you a little bit of background on Dr. Neil Clark Warren. He has a PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Chicago. He started eHarmony in the year 2000, and in 2004, I remember it was just after I started OPW, I was amazed that he, was, he raised $110 million uh, for 30% of eHarmony back in 2004. Six months ago, he bought the company back and became the CEO again. And he's making a lot of changes. I'm going to be talking about that momentarily. Uh, from 97 to, through 2005, he wrote seven books specifically on the topic of love and marriage. And he's been married for 50 years. So, so for about half an hour, I'll ask questions and then have several ten minutes of, uh, of floor questions, but I'd like to ask Dr. Warren, what is the philosophy of eHarmony's matchmaking? Um, <laughs> I could uh, talk too long. Um, I would say that um, I suffered through uh, the pain of um, my own parents' difficult marriage that would, they thought of as very successful. It lasted 70 years, but it wasn't well matched. My dad was very brilliant, and my mother was just above average on intelligence, and um, he married for safety. He married a, a young farm girl, and they both went through the eighth grade in Iowa public schools, and um, they loved each other, uh, but they didn't talk to each other. And my sister was 18 years older than I. My mother thought she'd gone through menopause um, seven and a half months before she found out she was pregnant with me. And um, she became very depressed when my sister got um, pregnant at the same time my mother did with me. And um, she spent her my first five years uh, being very depressed. It's very hard to be in a marriage. It's very hard to be in a family where your parents are depressed. And the other problem for me was that I grew up in Iowa uh, and I went to a little country school where there were 17 people between grades kindergarten and the eighth grade. That means there were two in very many classes. And I was the only person who was in kindergarten. And, uh, and I lived out on a farm, and I didn't have any really close friends. There weren't any people close to me. And my parents didn't talk. And when you grow up in a family with that kind of quietness, um, I think you do a lot of things. First of all, you suffer some. You feel sad and lonely a lot. I can, my number one question was, Mom, what can I do today? And um, I would go out with my dog, and my mother was so depressed, she didn't care where I went, I don't think. She didn't, she didn't have enough energy to, to know where I went. I would go out with my dog and my BB gun, and I would look for something that could um, feed my brain. What I've learned in the last, I can say a lot of years because I'm so old, but what I've learned in the last 70 years is that, um, I need a lot of stimulation. And I didn't have it when I was a kid. And I think I always thought to myself, wow, it would really be bad to end up in a marriage where you didn't have that kind of closeness and communication. So I 
I'll, I'll, I'll end this quickly. I said to my mother, so mom, how will I know when I find the right person to marry? And she said, there are three things that you'll need to know. First of all, you must be taller than she is. <laughs> and I have found over time that that is uh, absolutely uh, unnecessary. I've never had a single fight to protect Marilyn. I didn't need to be so big and monstrous uh, like I am. And, uh, the second thing was she said, you must be older than she is. And I am two years older than she is, but I didn't need to be older than she is because, you know, I'm going to die sooner than she is anyway. And it would have been better if she had been uh, uh, older than I was. And we might have died about the same time. Uh, the third thing was that she said, if she's not a member of your church group, she should be willing to switch. And so Marilyn did. She wasn't a member of my church group. Uh, quite involuntarily, she switched to my church group. And then within about a few months, we switched to her church group. <laughs> and then after a little while, we didn't like either church group, so we switched to a, an interdenominational church. And we've kind of gone from one church group to another through the years. and. Uh, and I realized that that was not a good criteria uh, for finding a marriage partner. So that, that was what I got from the beginning. And then there's just one other thing that I'd say, Mark, and that is that I saw some 7,000 people in psychotherapy over about 40 years. And I used to listen to them very, very carefully. So many of them were in so much pain about their marriages. And I would listen to them talk about why they were in pain and almost always the people were in pain because they married the wrong person and the marriage was in trouble the day it started and they didn't have the slightest tutoring about um, how to pick the right person to marry nobody had any tutoring like that in that day and so I think those two factors, watching my parents for 70 years, kind of struggled with a, a, a marriage that was kind, they were always kind, but a marriage that really wasn't vibrant, it really didn't hold together. And then the second thing being watching all these people through the years who got involved in relationships for one reason or another, but not for enough reasons to make their marriages really work. I, we have a lot of matchmakers in the room, and we've got a lot of, I uh, dare I say, techies, people who know the internet very well. And it's kind of interesting because a lot of the techies I don't think get so much face time with end users, but the matchmakers get an awful lot of face time with the end users. But nobody has as much face time, I think, as you, who spent 40 years in front and as a clinical psychologist uh, counseling. What would you say are the top couple of things that you put into the product, the initial eHarmony product, based on your experience as a 40 years counseling? Well, you know, we have something called the 10 must-haves. And um, I would say that uh, almost everybody has 10, 10 or so things that they just must have in the other person. And they vary. My 10 must-haves won't be the same as your 10 must-haves. But more importantly, we have 10 can't stands. And these are things that you just can't stand in another person. And um, for instance, the number one can't stand for a woman is she can't stand men who lie. And uh, we, we've gone down through those. And I think one of the things we try to put into our matching on a simpler level than all the algorithms that, that have become so, so complex we, we've tried to get people who really had somebody who matched all their 10 must-haves. If you've got 10 must-haves, it's just crucial that you find somebody who has those. And if you've got 10 can't stands, don't, I, I say to people all the time, don't, whatever you do, don't marry anybody who has any of your can't stands. I mean, it'll just drive you crazy over time. So I see, I used to see, more people get into marital trouble because they thought they could make somebody's can't stand better over time, where they could 
produce somebody's must have if, if they didn't have, even if they didn't have it at the time. I think another thing that we put into eHarmony from the first was a recognition that you need a lot of similarities. Um, I wrote this book, um, you know, clear back in 1983 or something like that, and it was uh, Finding the Love of Your Life. And, and in the book, we said 10 principles for finding the right marriage partner. And one of those principles that was find somebody to love who's a lot like you with a recognition that uh, opposites may attract, but they almost always uh, end up attacking one another after they've attracted one another. It, it's really hard to negotiate every single um, thing that you have different from someone else. So you need somebody who's a lot like you. I think those are some of the things that we put in. You've been making some big changes recently in the last few months. You have moved the sentiment of the workforce from business more towards sociology. Could you tell us more about the changes you're making and what we can expect to see in the new eHarmony? Well, we, you know, I, I have to confess to you that some of you are probably business people. Um, we made a mistake, in a way, by selling 30% of eHarmony, as Mark says, for uh, a lot of money. It was a lot of money for us at the time. We would never thought about making money. I remember thinking, if I could ever be worth two million dollars, that's all the money I'd ever want. And our co-founder, who happens to be our son-in-law, said, I, I need to have four million dollars. I said, four million dollars? How are you ever going to have four million dollars? And we ended up selling to um, these people 30% uh, of our company. And um, the mistake you make in doing that is that when somebody gives you that much money for a part of your company, they are business people. They only do that because they don't have a mission to try to make your company the best matchmaker in the world. They have a mission to try to make your company produce the greatest amount of revenue that you can possibly produce, the greatest amount of EBITDA. I've learned more business terms since we sold our company to these people than I ever knew before. And business people are, are in my opinion, um, they can be helpful to be uh, involved with you, but not very helpful. And we gave our company over to the business world. And we took social scientists out of the company. There weren't any psychologists who were involved anymore except I continued as chairman of the board, but I, it was a minority position that I had, and I kept having to fight with people who were um, wanting the company to rise in value all the time. So in coming back, we bought out, we paid $153.5 million to buy out the people who had paid us $110 million to buy in. And, um, we took control of the company back. And our goal, <laughs> and it's been really, really hard. And our goal is to uh, get a clearer understanding of our mission. Uh, our mission is to try to help people be wonderfully uh, happy and satisfied and content in being with the same person for the rest of their lives. Just uh, like Marilyn and I, you said 50 years, and I got to correct that. It'll be 54 years in two or three months, and those four years have been the really tough ones. Um, <laughs> we, we, have a, we have a house in King Brunport, Maine, that's a wonderful house. We haven't even been able to be in it for uh, all these months that uh, we've been back. We have a house down in, in uh, uh, Rancho Mirage. We haven't been in that one either. We stay in a little tiny, tiny, tiny apartment up in Santa Monica. And the reason for that is that we love our company way more than we love our houses. And we want our company to continue to do what we think our company's done for a lot of people. We're very proud, Mark, that, that, that Harris Interactive did a study to find that, that since 2005, we've had 565,000 marriages. 
And uh, those marriages are, the data is really good on those marriages. They're really satisfied people. And um, they're, they've endured better than any other. We're very proud of that. At the same time, as I've told Mark on the telephone, um, we, we've got to, as a society, we got to get together and sh start sharing more of our insights as we've got to give uh, a, a lot more away. You understand that when you're owned by business people and you have a patent, they don't want you sharing anything with anybody. Uh, certainly with no competitor. We, we've got to get to the place where we share a whole lot more with each other because ultimately we're all working to try to help the largest group of people possible, which is everybody in the world. It's a, it's a global company. And we want to help everybody in the country. So, yeah, we went through all that. I, I'm not a happy man um, being ruled by business people who only want to know how much we can make out of the company. If you're in this business, in my opinion, um, if you're in this for the business of it, you're, you're not going to be in it for the right reasons. Because this is, this is so much fun. Clearly there's a lot of social good that we can do. Clearly there's also a lot of social harm that we can do. How can we work together? And what one thing, if you could change one thing in the industry, would you change? Well, I'd have us sitting right here talking today. I'd start there and, and um, I would hope that um, there would be something that I would say today that would make you think that maybe I was trustworthy. And there would be something that you would say that I would say you're trustworthy too. And we would all say to each other something that would make us all think that we're in this, this thing called life uh, together. And uh, it's kind of an odd thing, you know, the most underestimated challenge uh, in the human uh, situation is finding the one person that you want to live your whole life with. For the rest of your days, you want to have your kids with. We, we were talking earlier in back in the back about uh, with one person um, about uh, his mother and father have each been married three times, and it's just created havoc for the children. And you know that's true. We, most in most situations where there is a divorce, it, it it creates a lot of pain, a lot of hurt. So the first thing I think we do is we get to know each other a little bit. And I apologize for the fact that we have not been a very active, we haven't been an active part at all of your organization. And it's because of Jamie Rupert who's sitting up here that I've gotten to know Mark and we've Skyped and we've talked a little bit and I've come to believe that you have the very best of intentions for your members and for your people. First thing we have to get to know is each other, and we have to come to the conclusion that you can trust the insides of that other person, that you're not going to try to take advantage of me, and I'm not going to try to take advantage of you. Did you branch again beyond internet? Yeah. It, it came, you know, we paid a lot of money. You probably know the, 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 the most interesting story about eHarmony is that we struggled along like a lot of companies have, and in, in uh, June of, I guess, 2003, we put $450,000 into television advertising. And we got it all back that month. I don't know exactly why, but we did. We got it all back that month. So the next month, we put another 500000 We put $950,000 into television advertising. The second month, we got it all back that month. So the next month, we put in another 500 So we put in a million four hundred fifty thousand dollars that next month into television advertising. And you know, I know how I look. I mean, I, I, I'm not I'm not a person that you see me go by and you say, wow, what a stunning looking person. <laughs> and uh, you know, when uh, Jay Leno would go on, 17 times Jay Leno went on the air and put this old, ugly gray wig on, played like he was me, and, 
and, and did this thing on eHarmony, you kind of have to swallow your pride a little bit. I look like that. And I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm, you do. <laughs> <laughs> I look like that. And, and you, you kind of make fun of it. And then we had, on Saturday Night Live, we had, we had two big sketches, you know, that made fun of the eHarmony.com kind of. And, but it was catching the public attention. And um, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> the, the expansion branching out into jobs as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. So we, over time, we got up to spending $100 million a year on advertising. And so we built a big brand. And we had, um, well, I think we have about 93% of the people now on an aided basis who say they know eHarmony.com. In other words, if you say, have you ever heard of eHarmony.com, they'll say yes. If you say, have you ever, when, when you think of uh, matching people with each other, what company do you think of? And about 73% of the people will say eHarmony.com. Now I know some of you are here for match, you're going to say no, 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 no. But that, that's the stuff that we've got. So when you paid as much as we paid, $100 million a year, we think we paid about $600 million altogether for the brand that we have. Well, if you paid that much for your brand, you ought to do more than just match people for marriage. So we came to the conclusion there, there are about 10 different relationship problems that people have. And we would like to help them with all of those. The very first one, you know as well or better than I do, and that is you, you badly need to have a better relationship with yourself. I mean, most of us only have about 5% conscious understanding of what goes on in our brain, so we're told by the neuropsychologist. And, and you, you've got to get to know yourself a whole lot better. So that's one area we'd like to get better at. The second one is the one with the mate. The third one is 65 to 70 percent of all the people in the United States say they're not very happy with the jobs they currently have. So we've got, to, we've got to help them get happier with their jobs. We've got to match them better with the job. And we think we've got maybe some of the algorithms that will help us match people with jobs that will really be satisfying to them. And then you know, this is uh, John Cassiopo, who is one of the great psychologists in America, is at the University of Chicago, says this is by far the loneliest that the United States of America has ever been. And the world as a whole is getting lonely and lonely. But the United States is really lonely. There are some 40% of the people who don't have a single confidant. So we've got to help people find friendships. We think that most people need about three to five friendships of the same sex and one or two of the opposite sex. So we'd like to work on the friendship dimension. So we got 10 of those dimensions that we want to work on. And we'll have to uh, get our, our uh, core business uh, back into a little better shape. You know, this is not an easy time. All of, it, all of us who are in competition with each other know that this is not an easy time to make the core business work perfectly. So. We, we, we have to do that. And then we have to branch out and help uh, all Americans. I want to say all English speaking people. I want to say on the basis of our international people. I think we're in 20 countries. We need to help the whole world learn how to relate to themselves and to each other far more effectively. And that's what we want to try to do. on OBW for questions. And a few questions came in, which I'm going to run through. The first one is from Christian Volman, and he's the CEO of eDarling, uh, which actually I believe you have a stake in. And he says, what are your international plans? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's kind of funny. Um, well, you know, first of all, eDarling, as you may know, is in, I think, some 20 countries, I think 20 or 22 countries, and we own a 30 to 35 percent stake in eDarling. And if you haven't heard about eDarling, they they start up these 
dating businesses in all these countries, and they've, they've done a rather stunning job of it, but it isn't easy anywhere in the world. I mean, there's a lot of competition. So the first thing that we w would hope that eDarling can do is get better and better at matching people successfully. And um, our plans with eDarling will depend on other things that are happening in our company. If you if you pay $153.5 million to your old stockholders to get your company back, you, you're, you're sitting there with a sort of desire to, to uh, establish your capital position a little bit. You don't, you don't want to run out of money. So the first thing we will have to do is to uh, get eDarling working again. Uh, at a deeper, better, bigger, more productive level. And I think you do that by helping them really do the job of matching people effectively. So if uh, he wants to know what we're going to do, we sort of want to know what he's going to do too because uh, we're, we're a minority stockholder in his company. Another question from uh, Northern Open Life Media points out a study that was done by Eli Finkel. And Eli basically said, uh, studied matchmaking and said, you know, it's uh, not really proven, essentially. So would you be open to open trials? How can we prove that it works? Yeah, you know, we're, 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 we're incredibly open to that. Ooh, we don't want to, we don't want to run a scam organization. We don't have any interest in uh, trying to do something that doesn't work, but can I, tell you off the record <laughs> it's off the record in a room that has three or four hundred people uh, we we have run a we have had a, uh, a a major research study very recently and this will be published uh, within the next couple months uh, run a major study involving 20,000 married people and we know these people are wrong. That uh, these people do people do get married uh, in large numbers, and these marriages are wonderfully durable, and they're wonderfully satisfying. Now, what I can tell you that's kind of interesting is that about 36 percent, according to this study, 36 percent of all people who get married today find their mate on the internet. That's fascinating. I mean, 12, 14 years ago when we started e I think it was 2%, something like that. And, and this is going to get bigger and bigger, you know that. And, um, and then the, what this study showed is that the people who did find their mate on the internet ended up being in dyads that were far more successful than the dyads that got started outside of a, a, a the, the internet. So I, I think that it's just a matter of a couple of months now that everybody in the country is going to see that that idea, that internet dating, internet meeting doesn't work, it is wrong. That's wrong. And that's a, a sad thing to have to sit around and not believe that something is not true, but kind of get beaten up for it uh, along the way. And let me tell you what's so great about internet dating, in my opinion. It is that you can, like on, on eHarmony's site, on many of your sites, you can get to know a whole lot about another person before you reveal your identity, before they reveal their identity, and you can make a lot of determinations that will be harder to make once your identity is known and once their identity is known. And you can um, end up making a far more uh, precise uh, decision about whether this is the right person for you to try or not. So uh, I, that's my, I have very passionate feelings about internet dating is the thing of the future. It is, in 10 years, it's the way virtually everybody's going to find it. You know, I wonder if the, the things that eHarmony could do for this industry moving forward. One of the things that eHarmony could do for this industry is IPO. 
at the right time that could be very good for helping the rest of the industry raise money. We have a few companies that are public, but very few. So um, is that still on the cards? Well, then, you know, you, you, you certainly do ask kind of trivial your question. This is actually from the CEO of Anastasia Day, by the way. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the question of whether you should have an IPO or not um, is uh, a question that I'm sure is, it's almost like the same-sex marriage question in America that is so hotly contested across America, across our industry, uh, uh, this is a hotly contested question. Let me tell you why. As soon as you have an IPO, you have the entrance of business into your situation where vast numbers of people are going to want one thing from your company, and that is for you to make more money than you made last year. And they're gonna push you to try to make that money under almost any conditions. And I don't like that. Now, the great thing about an IPO is that it spreads the equity around to a lot of different people. But, you know, I, I don't know how you feel about Google, and I don't know enough about Google to say, but I can tell you this, I was, I was pretty impressed with the way they ran their IPO. And I think if we could learn to run an IPO that would really keep the equity in the hands of the people who are committed to the mission of, of creating um, dyads in America that are really strong and good dyads, I think if we could do that, uh, we ought to have an IPO. But if we can't do that, then we ought to keep it in the hands of people who are committed to the mission. We, we right now have, uh, are going through this very thing. The question, we have four or five people who would like to own eHarmony e and keep it forever. Just be a privately owned company like Hershey's Chocolate. Or uh, are there are a number of privately owned companies. Bloomberg, for instance, I was talking to that reporter the other day, he said, we're a privately owned company. And, and you could be a privately owned company. Or you could spread it around to them. I think there are two arguments on that. I think we'll try to figure that out in the next couple of years. Right. Let's take a couple of questions from the floor. Well, do you want to run? Yeah. Well, I have the first question. If you don't mind. I've been doing this for 10 years. I think I deserve a question on this one. <laughs> because I know what these guys are going to ask. And what they're going to ask you is, are you, are you looking to acquire? And if you are looking to acquire, what is it you're looking to acquire? And, if, and, and on top of that, how do they go about approaching? Well, that's a great question. Um, you know, when I talk about these 10 relationship sites, I think that um, we're, we're going to have to acquire some of that. We don't know anything about aging and the problems of aging, but that's a big relational issue in America. We need to acquire program that could take advantage of our, of, 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 of uh, you know, our name and what we're all about. We need to acquire it. And we need to have people who know how to acquire sites. I can tell you right now that I've been waiting for somebody to call me who is a broker who has access to sites like aging sites and who can help us with that. Um, so yes, we are looking to acquire, and we will probably need to use professional people. We would like to use brokers who really care about the match between the site itself and, and ourselves. You take like a, a Match.com, they've acquired a lot of sites, right, over the years. We spent a lot of time talking with them about our site being acquired before we even started. And we were in the same town, Pasadena, California, and um, as, as Match. And um, I uh, think that they know how to acquire a site. And one of the things I've been told is that Match.com acquires a site and they pretty much leave the, the leaders in, in place and they let the leaders continue to run that site and they don't bring a heavy hand down on the site. We, we don't know exactly how to acquire sites. We, we acquired four or five little wedding sites 
and we were pretty much a failure in all four or five of them. Um, we uh, were not very good at that. We've grown almost exclusively through television, and our television has been, um, we think, our television has been effective because we have been seen as trustworthy, and we, we, we pray to be trustworthy. We, we have never used, we have one commercial in which we have people from the outside uh, who were not our members in that commercial. And we, uh, this was when I was gone, we ran that commercial for one month and then we dropped it. It cost us, it's, it's gonna cost us about $3 million. We're still fighting over it a little bit. So we want, this to be a trustworthy site. We want the, the advertising to be trustworthy, and that's the way we think we can grow most effectively. But in the meantime, we've got, if we're gonna have 10 sites that relate to relational issues, we're gonna have to acquire some of those sites. Okay, I got a question here. By the way, let me ask the question. We can't take many, because we're gonna leave, but give your name and company. By the way, one other thing, we have these survey forms on your table. Please fill them out. Know what your opinions are. Like it, dislike it, let us know. Be honest. Thank you. This is Dave Rubin. My website is veggiedate.org. And I was wondering, I would like to hear your perspective on where you think the future is in terms of paid memberships or not paid memberships. Are we going to continue to see both existing, coexisting, or is one going to dominate and ultimately? eliminate the other, or what do you think is going to happen? Well, you know, when, when, when I finished at the University of Chicago, uh, which is, as you know, a very uh, uh, socially leaning uh, school, very, very uh, uh, liberal, and believes that you should take care of everybody, literally. Carl Rogers, I went there to study under Carl Rogers. Carl Rogers believed you should pay the client for coming in and seeing you. That, that's a hard business to make work, but, <laughs> but he really believed that you should take care of everybody. Um, there's some part of me that would um, like to do something like that. So I went out to California and I, the first thing I did, I went to a local church and I said, I am going to donate five hours of my time every week to do free psychotherapy at this church for anybody who wants to come. And I found that um, over time, very, very few people wanted to see me under those circumstances. It didn't feel right to them. Um, and so one person actually said to me, is there any way I can come and see you at your office and pay your usual fee? Now, that's a very hard thing to turn down uh, on my part. So I said, yeah, then I could. So I've come to the conclusion that sometimes people get more out of what they pay a little bit for. And they get even more out of what they pay a little bit more than that for. So I guess my sense is that if you have something really worthwhile, like we spent three years with upwards of seven psychologists working on our matching system and we, we try to really match people as effectively as we can. We've got something of value and if you have something of value and people pay you that value for that, I think they'll get more out of it. On the other hand, I told my wife the other day, I, said, I, I don't have the slightest idea if I'm a socialist or a capitalist. If I were dealing out the money in a monopoly game right now, I'd give everybody exactly the same amount. I don't like the way it's set up right now, that some people have so much money and a lot of people have almost no money. I just, there's something dead, deadly wrong about that. And, and so, um, I guess bottom line, I think you get more out of something that you pay something for. At the same time, I, I would hope that everybody in our country can have an opportunity to have the services in the emotional in the in the emotional area that they need. That's not a great answer to your question, but it tells you what I go through. 
uh, Matthew Pitts from uh, whitelabeldating.com. Um, you, you've talked very uh, eloquently about uh, you know, the beauty of relationships in you know, 54 years with your wife and the fact that everyone, everyone deserves a lasting, loving relationship. Um, but looking back on you know, eHarmony and what you've achieved over all the years, you're very proud of you know, your relationship um, uh, heritage, the number of people you brought together. Um, from where I sit, um, the one area I think that isn't served in the dating area very well is a true relationship site for people of uh, the same sex. So yeah. you tend to get hookup sites, yeah. but what you don't get is a really good, you know, same values, you know, everyone's equal, they're all in touch with the same relationship status, love, long term relationships, but there, in my opinion, there's a gap in the market for that. Do you feel that's something that eHarmony in 2013 could consider as a viable uh, relationship site? I think so. But, you know, I, I, want, I want to comment on how hard that is. You know, it's, it's hard for every politician. Look what Barack Obama went through before he made his determination about where to stand on that issue. It's really a hard issue. It is just as America like this. I say to my friends all the time, so where do you stand on circumcision? You know, circumcision was the hottest issue in Jesus' day, 2,000 years ago, in Israel. And people would divide up. They, were, they would kill each other on, on the basis of that issue. I honestly believe same-sex marriage that issue will be gone in five to eight years. I think, I, can, I think you can feel it leaving now. We don't know very much about same-sex marriage, but we have a same-sex marriage site, compatiblepartners.com, and we have worked hard on it. We, we have people who give a lot of time to try to make that a better site. We also lost a major part of our business when we put that site up. We didn't, um, we, we, we asked to be spared that because in my practice, I had never had a gay couple in, in, in my practice. I didn't know it. And, and some of my gay couple friends told me that matching people who are uh, same sex is a, is a very different job than matching people who are opposite sex. And so I saw, I saw all the companies that match people um, for same sex, and I thought, wow, I hope they can do as good a job as we try to do with opposite. So, so the New Jersey Attorney General said, no, you put a sign up for same sex, and you can, what's the word I always forget? Disclaimer. Um, yeah, we, we put a disclaimer up that you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> and so we did it. We, we, we had that kind of a sign, but we actually had people working at eHarmony and I'm trying to make the, those matches better and better. Have those people been served well? Not as well, probably, as the other people. Do they need to be served better? Yes, they need to be served better. Does there need to be a lot more research done in that whole area? I think so. There needs to be a lot of research done. Um, you know, when somebody told me the other day that 70 to 80 percent of all child abuse happens in the first three years, I thought, wow, now that's something, what, what in the world is that all about? And when you just read the study this week about people who are, uh, you know, abusers uh, may well have neural dysfunction. Uh, we need to understand what that's all about. But Fundamentally, what I want to say to you is I want to be committed to doing whatever it is that we do as well as we can do it, and that's something I think we can do better, and I think we need to give more time to, and we need to spend more money in research. I can speak up. Yes, okay. Hi, Dr. Warren. I'm Tom Simon with Google. Thank you very much for your uh, IPO comments. You have a very noble cause, and it's been great hearing from you today. Hold on, hold on. Yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry. This is why we can do it. Name and come. Tom Simon, Google. We're just talking stocks. 
Not really. So you, you have um, a, a new uh, mission statement or you're expanding outside of what you are, you've been known for with number one in serious relationships and focusing on relationships. You're expanding into careers and you mentioned improving yourself, finding friends. How are you gonna distill that message and simplify it to the masses, like in a television creative, in a 30 second spot, like what your new offering is gonna be? Do you think you're gonna have various creative executions that'll be specifically for eHarmony careers or eHarmony improve yourself or you know the different um, 10 areas, the 10 relation, relationship issues you address? Well, you, you can see why he works for Google. Um, and that's a very, very thoughtful question that we've spent a lot of time trying to think through. You know, like, we, we want to use our brand, just like Google uses its brand for a lot of different things. We, you, you get a certain amount of uh, uh, credibility uh, by, by using the brand that people have, have learned it, it works for them. Um, but um, we don't know if we, we're going to be able to use our brand. I mean, we haven't, I, I have to tell you that, I tell you about these 10 different sites, I act like I know what I'm talking about. The fact is that we haven't advertised a single site other than our core site for matching of, of, of people for marriage. Um, but I would hope that we could get, here's the way I think of it. I would hope that every, every time we advertise our job site, that we can get some benefit for our total brand, upwards of, in my mind, 25 or 35 percent of our of, of, of what we get out of that commercial will will benefit our total brand. The rest will benefit our job site. You know the problem with jobs, by the way. I mean, you guys know more about it than we do by far, but the problem with jobs is that the applicant gives all the information and the culture of the company is not well explained and the, and the personality of the person who's going to be in charge of, of this applicant in this job is not well known because they don't want to give up any information about themselves. And so you have, you have a worse, we have a worse problem in America with job dissatisfaction than we do marital dissatisfaction. So we, we want to try to do that research. That particular question is going to be a marketing question that will really uh, require the best that we've got to give. And we'll probably look to people like you. We, 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 we worry about Google having so much money and um, you, you probably, the first time that you find out that one of our people uh, learns how to advertise in a way that helps the brand and helps the particular product, you'll offer them three times as much as we can pay them and we'll lose them. I'm just, I'm sort of kid, kind of kid. I hope so. But um, what was the other part of that? It was just, to, if you had had in your marketing department had thought about just like how you're going to distill that offering and if you're going to have separate creatives for you. So I think you've touched on a lot of those exactly. But it is interesting um, when brands try to be everything to everyone. You know, some people may say there's concern for uh, ignoring your core base yeah. to who got you where you are. Yeah. I mean, you're number one in serious relationships. Of course, you had a correlation to marriage way back in the day of the correlation of Christianity. Um, but as you're changing the message a little bit again, just how can you simplify that, distill it, and then are you gonna have separate creatives for careers, all that sort of thing? Yeah. So it's, it's a big question. It, it, it's a big, big question, and it's a, and it's a precisely dead-on question that we're gonna have to deal with. But it's a fun question, too. Yeah. Because ultimately, we would love to be the place that people think about as as a state that we take serious relationships of all kinds and relational pain and we really try to help people who are in relational pain and so we've got to try to think about how you differentiate all of those at the same time you know like for instance i'll tell you um, um, 
this, this friendship thing really has hold me right now. Uh, how many people there are in America that have, haven't a single confidant. Now that's a, that's a big thing to try to help somebody. Like if you take a, 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 an area, say 30, 30 mile radius, and you try to help that person find somebody uh, three to five persons of the same sex and one or two of the opposite sex, and and you try to help them find those persons and get together with those persons, and you try to make that work for you in terms of a business come up, it's going to take a very thoughtful approach to the world to tell them what you're offering them. So um, we'll have to work hard at that, and you guys are way out of time. It's a fun challenge, I said. It's a challenge. That's a challenge.